tonight, we don't have worship. Um, it's just kind of intro night, super casual, um, not quite as intensive study. You guys are all like, oh, praise the Lord, right? Because it was a Monday, let me tell you. Um, but we're going to have our intro. Normally, we'll have worship. I'll get into, into all that in a second. But let's go ahead. Hi, guys. Let's go ahead and open in prayer. Father God, we're so thankful for your faithfulness, bringing us back to another women's study season. Lord, we just pray that as, as we gather in this time, Lord, as we open up your word and we fellowship as women, Lord, that we would just grow to be more like Jesus. And Father, that's only possible if you bless us with the presence of your spirit. So Lord, be upon us tonight. I pray that you would um, just touch those sensitive, squishy parts in our heart that need touched and um, grow us more this season, Lord, just to be more like you, because that's the whole goal. Uh, thank you, dear Jesus, and be with us. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Okay, so, intro night. Okay, I'm really excited. So if I talk really fast, I'm going to try to slow down, okay? I'm just so happy to see you guys. I feel like, I don't know, it's like our, my second family is all these beautiful female faces and I just miss you guys. I hope you guys had a good summer. My summer has been insane. So first, I re decided to remodel our pop-up camper. So I remodeled our pop-up camper. And then we finally had the opportunity to remodel our schoolroom and the outside of our house. So it's been the summer of projects. And holy moly, has it been just slamming. Like every summer is, but this one just felt especially packed. I've been really excited to be done with all the, well, mostly done. You know that 99% you get done and then it's like four years later you have all the cosmetic stuff actually done. So I'm in that 99% and then in three years I'll be done with those projects. But um, yeah, so I'm stoked to have school started again. I feel like slowing down back into regular pace. <laughs> slowing down, does that ever really happen? It's my plan, but I don't think it'll ever really happen. Anyway. Monday night study, what is it about? What are we doing? So first, let me share a little bit about me uh, for any of those of you who don't know me. <laughs> My name is Andrea Shaver. I am 37 years old. That part's scary. I can't believe how old I am. Um, let me tell you about my connections, okay? So Pastor Ben and his wife Judy, they're my parents. So, and they're ancient, <laughs> not really. That's my mom, okay? I didn't say it, she did. Yeah, yeah. So Pastor Ben's my dad and his wife Judy's my mom. Uh, Sarah, who leads worship uh, with her husband John, Sarah is my sister. So that makes Pastor John my brother-in-law. Pastor Mike is, and Jean, they're my in-laws. I married their son. So I am related to every pastor in the church somehow. Um, yeah. Uh, we always joke, my husband and I, that we can never leave Calvary Chapel Montrose, ever. And he's not a pastor. I'm not a pastor's wife, but we're integrated. We've just been here since the beginning, right? Uh, Mark and I have been married f uh, for a very long time. Uh, it was 16 years this summer. Again, one of those numbers that you throw out and you're like, holy moly. Uh, we married at the ripe old age of 20 and 21. Of course, I'm older. I'm a, a half a year older than he is and a quarter of an inch taller, and I will always hold that over him, always. Uh, after six years of getting used to each other and learning what it meant to be married, we had uh, started having our kids. Alora is our first one. She's 10 now. Uh, she's beautiful and vibrant, and my little servant helper, who's just the best thing on earth, until she breaks down weeping for hours for no reason at all, and She's a little dramatic, she is. She did drama camp this year, it was awesome. It was totally her. Uh, two years after that, we had Bria, who is my challenge that I like to say. She's my stubborn, feisty, rebellious, but then she turns this little sweet corner and you just love her to pieces because she's the cutest thing ever. Uh, that's my eight-year-old. Uh, and then I also have a five-year-old son named Gavin who is, oh my gosh, he is a boy's boy. And when I first found out I was having a boy, it was one of those where I was like, 
I know how to do girls. I was raised with two sisters, and then I had my two girls. Like, I'm good with girls. And then God throws me this curveball boy who I just love to death, and he melts my heart to pieces, but he is all boy. And in homeschooling, I do homeschool. So in homeschooling him, it's this whole new ball field. Why? Because boys are different than girls. And we're going to get into that in this tonight's intro a little bit. We'll put that off for later. So I have three kids. You'll get to know them almost as well as I do because I talk about them all the time. Kids make the most wonderful biblical examples. And so do husbands. Although my husband will try to tamp it down a little because you never want it to get, you know, cross that line of, what did you tell the ladies about me? (laughs) Oh yeah, sorry, I let it slip that, oh no, I won't. Tamp that down. Kids, you can know everything about them. But uh, anyway, I am a homeschool mom. I love reading, especially fiction. I just, Christian fiction is just my jam. Frank Peretti is my favorite author of all time. Uh, He's so good. Um, I love baking. So like the pumpkin chocolate chip cookies back there, oh, they're like the fall kiss of fallness. It's just pumpkin chocolate chip cookies. But they're Don't let them deceive you. They're the easiest cookies in the world. If you want the recipe, I'll give it to you because, gosh, it's so good. It's like dump everything together, throw it in the oven, and they always turn out amazing. That's my kind of recipe. Um, Because while I love baking, I still, for the life of me, can't make mashed potatoes. And everyone in my family go, wait, what? Mashed potatoes? No. Mashed potatoes are the hardest recipe in the book. Okay, Julia Child, she, I know, had a hard time, you know, deboning a duck. No, it's mashed potatoes. Finding that balance of creamy but not goopy or gooey or, no, can't, I can't do it. So, there you go. I'll bring the dessert, you bring the mashed potatoes. I told Sarah, my sister, if I ever wrote a book, that's what I was going to title it. You bring the mashed potatoes. So, there you go. Uh... Okay, as far as uh, connection to the Lord, right? Because connection to church is one thing, but connection to the Lord. I gave my heart to Jesus when I was four. Um, I remember the pastor giving a call to all those sinners out there in the audience, and my little four-year-old heart knew how much I needed Jesus because I was just a wicked, evil little four-year-old, and I knew that I needed his salvation. So I remember coming up at an altar call and kneeling on the steps at Calvary Chapel Vista and giving my heart to the Lord. Um, and truly, truly, the Lord has been with me ever since. I, uh, of course, have been baptized, you know, a hundred times because that's what pastor's kids do. Every time someone's in the pool, it's like, me too, right? But I remember really, really getting baptized, I guess, when I was 12, and I was like, no, this is going to be my faith, and this is, and that's the last time I have been baptized was 12. Um, but, oh, I've been a pastor's kid for as long as I can remember, um, But everything about my testimony is just of God's grace and faithfulness and endurance. You know, it's one of those where the Lord can see you through. The Lord can keep you walking with him for years after years after years and not let you slip away. That's my testimony of who God is and how powerful he's been in my life. I can constantly learn grace. That's my biggest thing with him is always learning more grace. Because being a pastor's kid, you can get pretty self-righteous. I mean, I own this church, right? I can run around it and nobody will yell at me because my dad's the pastor and my brother-in-law's the other pastor and my father-in-law's the other pastor. I can do what I want, but not really. And the Lord shows you more and more just grace and love for people and then how much more he gives it to us to give out. So I don't know. He's just so good. Um, I've taught Monday Night Women's Study now for six or seven years, and gosh, I love it. I just love teaching, and I love how much the Lord shows me through his word, and then getting to share it with you guys. Um, It's so funny because people always ask, are you nervous? You know, like even dad, are you nervous opening night? I'm like, no, I'm excited. I mean, I've got energy, but I'm like, woo, I'm pumped. This is just, it's a gift I know from him because it's not a normal thing to be okay being up here. So I know it's not of me. It's definitely of him. But I love using it. I love when God gives you a gift, whatever it is, when you're doing what he wants you to do. There's just a, a passion there. Um, and yeah, there you go. Okay, let's talk about Monday night women's study logistics, right? We're ladies. We like the detail. So let me give you the detail. We will try to start promptly at 6.30. Uh, That's the goal. One of the reasons we're going to try to start promptly is because we do streaming. 
So our studies are live streamed uh, every Monday night, and part of that is for the benefit of our wonderful streaming sisters, hi streaming sisters, who are at home, who for one reason or another can't make it to Monday night study. They still want to be a part of it. And so you'll meet some of them on Sunday morning saying, hey, I'm part of study too and whatever. It's kind of cool to connect even though we're not necessarily all in the same room. But if we keep it on time, then we're on time for everybody. So we'll usually start at 6.30 with worship and then go right into study. Um, if you would like coffee or snacks beforehand, just come a little earlier, grab them, and get your seat. My mom just said she's usually here at 6, so if you want to come way early and talk and, you know, eat seven cookies, there you go. You can do that too. Come early. Um, and then, okay, <laughs> my hope this year, my plan is to end a little bit earlier um, you guys are all going, yeah, it's not going to happen. I love to talk, right? So uh, 8 o'clock is max. That's when we stop. But I'm going to try my best this year to end sometime around, I don't want to say a number because then you're going to hold me to it, but I'm going to try to end somewhere around 7.30, 7.45, just to try to give a little bit more time for afterwards, fellowship, coffee, snacks, talking to one another. <laughs> we'll see if that works. I may burn that part of my notes later, but that's where we're at. Uh, speaking of snacks, there should be a sign-up sheet at the back. We didn't make one. We're going to put a sign-up sheet at the back at some point. So if you want to bring snacks one week, that way it doesn't always fall to the same people. There you go. Um, okay, another thing about study. I hate homework. So I don't know if you've ever been to one of those women's studies where they're like, Here's a whole story on the book of John, and now go home and read these 45 pages and fill out notes on all your feelings from verse 1 to verse 7. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't do it. I, homeschooling, and then I just hate homework. I hate it. I know I homeschool. It's all homework. But uh, I don't like extra, extra work. So here's my way around that. There is something to thinking about study during the week and, you know, getting more out of it. But what I would like to do is, uh, every few weeks um, in going through these women of the Bible, like we're going to talk about, I want to do discussion nights. So we did them a few of them last year. I loved it. I loved us being able to get together and share, not only discussing what we've learned and whatever, but also what's going on in our lives. What, where do you need prayer? Where, what do you want to share? Because when we're doing that actual fellowship of talking about the Lord with one another, there's a growth that happens there. Not only between us and the Lord when you find out, oh man, Lord, you did this for them. You could do that for me. Oh man, Lord, I am going through such a hard time. So are they. I'm going to pray for them while I pray for myself doing all this. But there's also a growth with each other. It's these little studies that we have. We have two women's studies and two men's studies here at Calvary. And the point of them is for fellowship, to get to know one another, to plug in and build roots and build friendships and things. So I think those discussion nights will help. Now, when we have a discussion night, it won't be streamed. Sorry, uh, streaming sisters. You won't get to be a part of that because I want you guys comfortable enough to share without thinking about your intimate details going out into the netherverse, right? So streaming, what I usually do is I'll pre-record some of the questions just so that if you're at home and you want to discuss them amongst your pets, you can, <laughs> or come that night. If you don't normally come, that's fine, but if you want to come on discussion night to be a part of that, hey, great night to just come and fellowship, right? Um, there you go. Uh, we will be live on Mondays. Again, one of the things about women's study, the reason we had to keep it at 632 was lateness, right? Most women don't love driving at home in the dark at night, so we tried to keep it a little earlier for that purpose. But in the winter, it's kind of hard when it gets dark at 4.30. So if it gets super dark and then it gets super stormy or it's really icy that day, we will probably cancel women's study and just have it online. So usually I'm done studying, you know, earlier the weekend before. So I have all my notes together. So if it looks stormy Monday-ish, I'll try to plug it in and stream it and get it as close to 6.30 as possible. And you can watch it from home. That way no one's getting endangered on the roads. Uh, one more note. There will be no study in two weeks. So next week we're going to have study, but then that next, that next weekend is the women's retreat, and it is exhausting. And we have so much fun, but we come home just pooped. 
So we're not going to have Monday night study that week just because uh, I'm tired. <laughs> we need one week off. So that's the only planned break at the moment. Every other Monday we should be here. Okay. Study. What are we doing this year? The question that's been burning on all of your minds, I'm sure. We're studying women. Are you surprised? <laughs> okay, so our study this year is called Women of the Word. I call it our wow study. Ah, I'll have to make a cool like wow slide. Wow, our Women of the Word study. It's not a book. The last, last year, remember, we went through Romans. Oh my gosh, it was so good. And the year before that, we went through John. Oh my gosh, it was so good. And the year before that, we actually went through all the books of the Bible. And I kind of like that. It was good to give you guys a survey of all of Scripture and where Jesus was in every book. The years before that, we've done books. This year, it was like, all right, Lord, where do you want us? You know, I'd been kicking around the idea of Hebrews at one point and thought, is this now the time? And then things, the way the Lord works, you know, he just kind of plugs an idea and then kind of keeps reaffirming the idea. And so it came up this year of why not do a survey of all the Bible, but focusing on the women in Scripture. Uh, why? Why women? The biggest reason to me is because we live in an extremely confusing time for females. Uh, we have more rights than ever. I mean, we can vote, we can own property, we can pick who we get to marry. I mean, there's a lot of rights we have right now that have never been around for women. Um, but I would also suggest that in all these rights that we have, we also have less freedom to be women than we have ever had. There's so much pressure on the world for us to be certain kinds of women and not other kinds of women. I don't know. It, it's really confusing. It's a really confusing time. Women are no longer allowed to be just women. Um, maybe you're a girly girl. Maybe you love everything feminine. You've got the, have you ever been in someone like this house where they're like Victorian? I mean, their whole house is like, you, you're worried about sitting on the sofa because you're going to break it because it's from 1924 and it's all flower petals and you, the whole house smells like essential oils and you're like, oh my gosh. And the, you'll never see the lady in pants ever, right? I know women like that. They love everything about being women. That's awesome. But maybe you're on the other end of the spectrum. Maybe you're the sporty girl or the fish gut, you know, look at me, I can be on a loan for 400 days and make my own shelter. Awesome. Truly, most of us are in between somewhere, a little bit of both, right? Um, but we come, women are, we're different. We come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, every different color, right? Uh, we have a wide spectrum of interests, hobbies, talents. You know, some of us can take apart car engines and be, like, amazing. And then some are like, look at this doily I made. And you're like, wow, I could never do that, right? Um, we have a lady that was like, hey, we want to get a sewing class together. And I'm like, not me. You just have so much fun sewing. That's so awesome. I won't be there, right? Uh, but in the midst of all these differences, we're still women, there are certain qualities that define us as women, and the world is so confused about what those qualities are. It tries to downplay a lot of the really important ones and just continues to confuse the mix. A big part of that today is that men are encouraged to pretend to be women, and women are encouraged to, try to pretend to be men. Uh, evidence, okay? You see that in the Olympics that happened just this year. I love watching the Olympics. This year was a little weird with the COVIDness, you know, but still, did you guys hear about, <laughs> okay, this is women's study, right? Not kids' study, so I can use bigger words. <laughs> there was a man woman that wanted to compete, a man that wanted to compete in the women's heavyweight lifting. Did you hear about him, her? Anyway, they, I don't know what pronoun to use, he had to leave the women's competition because he pulled a testicle. And you're like, doesn't that kind of disqualify you, the fact that you have those? I mean, it's confusing, right? I do not understand. And also, what kind of man takes any sort of glory in competing with scientifically proven less strong females? You're the greatest of the least. Go you. 
I mean, truly, I just, I do not understand it. I really don't. It's a total confusing issue. Uh, we see it in sporting, we see it in sharing bathrooms and weird things like that where it's like, no, no, no. We women are private about our bathrooms. I tell you what, I don't know who thought it was a good idea to open it up to the other gender. They are not allowed in here. <laughs> this is our private space. Like, we need these bathrooms, right? Blurred lines. And if you think it's only happening out in the wider world, you're wrong. It happens here in Montrose. It's amongst our own kids and our own things. I told you earlier that um, Alora went to drama camp this year. Well, there was a drama moment at drama camp. Uh, the way they had it, it was at Magic Circle Theater, and it was great. Let me tell you, the ladies that run that drama camp, they're just awesome. But uh, they had the elementary school kids, which was who Alora was with, and then they had the junior high kids who did their own play, but they kind of practiced in the same areas and stuff, even though they were separate groups. Anyway, it came up the second day that one of the junior high girls identified as a male. She's 12, but she wants to be known as, you know, whatever boy's name she had picked. And so she had requested to use the boy's dressing room because she's a boy. And of course, the, the drama camp instructors are like, um, <laughs> because the world says you can't tell this 12-year-old that they're not a boy or a girl or whatever they're trying to identify as. So they, trying to be politically correct while also considering the other children, said, okay, you can use the boys' dressing room, but not while the boys are in it. So it became a thing where they had to supervise and let the boys who were gender-specific boys use the dressing room, and then when they were all gone, they let this girl go and use it. And it came out, and some of the parents were freaking out because their boys came home and said, Mom, they let a girl use the boys' dressing room. And they're like, you know, yes, we did, but, you know, we tried to do it in a way that protected all the kids. And you appreciate that. You appreciate that they did what they did. Uh, but it was, it's here. It's in Montrose. There's a little 12-year-old girl here in Montrose who fully believes she's a boy and is identifying as a boy at 12 because our culture pushes it. They push them into it. Have you ever had a thought that maybe you were attracted to a girl a little bit? Growing up is confusing. I've had some weird dreams, let me tell you, but I've never once woken up from that dream and been like, oh my gosh, I think I'm homosexual. But I've had dreams where I'm like, I played the man in the dream. Okay, I've also played a burrito. So I, this is not giving you any context, but I've had dreams like that. And if I'm listening to the world, encouraging that and trying to promote that and saying, maybe there's something there that you're, no, I'm not a burrito. No, I'm not a man. It's a dream. But if I don't have an anchor to tell me these things, we can go anywhere. And we're seeing it right here. Have you guys been into Target lately? Okay, so Mark and I went into Target the other night and he's looking for everything. He's out of clothes. So it's like, I got to go shopping for everything right now. Okay, let's go to Target. So we get over there and you get to the men's department. Now, I wasn't paying attention in the women's department because we just walked right through to the men's. But every single stall of clothing in the men's department in Target now says men's and women's clothing on everything. Every sign on there says men's and women's clothing. And I don't know if it's the same in the women's department, but it is in the men's. Now, I buy men's t-shirts. I like the way they fit. I've always been taller, and I like shirts that don't come up here every time I lift my arms up, because I've got a stomach, okay? I like that hidden, tuck that down there. So I buy a lot of men's t-shirts, because they're longer. I just like the fit. But I'm not pretending that they're women's t-shirts. You know, so there's a difference. I fully acknowledge that they're men's. And my husband doesn't have a problem with me wearing men's t-shirts. I think he would have a problem if I went and bought boxer shorts. And I don't know. You know, there's a line there. There's a line. And I don't know why you feel like you have to call it the men's department, but label everything men's and women's clothes. They're not. They're de not designed for you. Your hips are different. Have you ever tried to wear a pair of men's jeans? The button's on the other side, for one, and their pockets are bizarre, and they just don't, they're just not built for you. Sorry, static. But it's happening here in Montrose, even this confusion. Shh, microphone. Ladies, it's a lie. Men cannot be women. Women cannot be men. No matter how many surgeries or fake hormones or any of that stuff you take, uh, and I want to give you some examples, because I love details. 
Oh my gosh, I'm sorry for the popping. Okay, so I borrowed a DVD from Mike and Gene Shaver. They have this old Stealing the Mind conference uh, with this one talk. <laughs> I'm all nervous now. With this one talk that's called Why Women Are Weird and Men Are a Mess. Now, it's done by David Moore, and he does it as a discussion on marriage. His whole point in this message is how different men and women are, and how once we recognize some of those differences, we can relate to our husbands better. We can understand where they're coming from, and they can understand where we're coming from. Now, why is that important? Because we're different. So I'm gonna give you some of the facts that he gives on this whole differences thing and why we can never be the same thing. Okay, are you ready for this? Okay, first, our bodies. Men's bodies and women's bodies are different. And I don't just mean shape, right? Okay, we got some places that they don't have. Now, they, you can fake it now with surgeries and that kind of thing, but there are some things that you cannot fake and cannot change. One thing is your cells. The very cells that make up your body in men and women are 100% different. There's different chromosomes. And as of right now, they can't change that. So even if someone identifies and they take all the right hormones and whatever, they cannot change their cell structure chromosomes to change genders. You could still check that on that person and tell what gender they were born as, okay? Another difference is bone size. Our bones are different sizes and they're placed in different places. Our hips, right? Ladies, we know about our hips. They're much wider. They don't lie, right? They are baby producing hips. They're positioned differently to allow the carrying of a tiny child or a massive child, if you're like me and had my babies, right? Uh, we have different lung capacities and lung sizes. We actually breathe at different rates, too. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, and blood density. Men have thicker blood than women. Uh, muscle mass and strength, that's kind of one that we all usually know. That's why it's like, honey, I, I have this saying at my house. It's, I need a hero. And when my husband hears that, it means I need you to open this jar for me. <laughs> or my water bottle that they glued way too tight. I need a hero. And he goes, eek. I'm like, thank you. Right? Muscles are different. Uh, women have thinner skin than men. But we also have an extra fat layer underneath that skin to keep us more insulated, which is a good thing. And did you know that it also makes us softer? We are scientifically softer than men. I tell you what, your kids know this. You know why? Because when they get hurt, whose lap do they run to? Not daddy's bony thighs. They run to you and your soft, cushy little pillow you got right there. Have you ever tried to lay your head for very long on your husband's shoulder? It's awful. Their shoulders are awful, and yet they can lay on your shoulder forever because it's like this nice, soft, little, here you go, right? We're softer. The bummer about it means it makes it harder for us to lose weight with that extra layer. Have you ever worked out with your husband? You're like, we're both going to do this together. And in a week, they lose like 12 pounds, and they're like, yeah, look at me. And you've like done everything, even more. They cheated, and you were so good, and you lost like half a pound. You were like, I hate you. I hate you, right? We are different. It's because of our different genetic makeup. Our brains are different. You're like, I could have told you that. They are. When they map the activity in a man's brain when he's thinking, he is a one-sided brain thinker. He only thinks with one side at a time, very compartmentalized. It makes men super good at engineering because they can figure a problem and just focus on that problem and get it done. It's also, there's something scientific about it that makes them able to rotate things in their mind so they're really good at packing a car or a cooler because they can see the shapes together. Even though we're in there going, no, that should go over there and that should go over here. They're like, please leave me alone, I got this. Mentally, I am already well suited to this, okay. Maybe you have the one husband who's not, okay? But we're talking in genetic terms, all right? Gen 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 generic terms, general terms. Men are mono-minded, singularly focused. Uh, they shop for one thing and one thing alone when they go to the grocery store. That's that, they need that one thing, and you're like, honey, can I? No, I'm getting that one thing, and I'm leaving. 
Mark and I discovered very early on in our marriage that we cannot grocery shop together because I am the aisle shopper. I want to see what I forgot to put on my list because I don't want to come back tomorrow for that one other thing I missed, right? Uh, that's why, too, <laughs> when they're on the phone, they only want to be on the phone with that one person. They don't want you asking them to ask that person about something else. It drives Mark crazy. Mark, ask your mom if she's coming to the thing. No, I'm asking her about this one thing, and I'm talking to her and not to you. Well, sorry. But that's how their minds work. They can't focus on three things at once. It's one thing, and that's why they get that one thing done. They're goal-oriented. Women, however, we're called stereo-minded. Again, scientifically, when we think with our brains, we use both sides. Everything's lighting up and going all crazy. It's why we can be talking on the phone while instructing our children and cooking dinner and getting the laundry ready. We can be multitasked and still, not that we always do everything with the best, you know, highest, you know, standards, but we can get it all done, right, at one time. We can talk on the phone while having another conversation with somebody else and follow both. Um, we uh, remember detail a little better, and we are detailed-oriented. Men are bottom-line-oriented. That's why when it's, how'd that go? It went great. Okay, good. How'd that go? Oh my gosh, I went to this store, and I went to that store, and I had this, and I had that, and he's like zoned out already. He's focused on something else, right? We want every detail. Uh, we have other differences too, personality differences, relational differences, we're verbal, they tend to be visual, right? You see that a lot in the nursery. <laughs> so if you ever work in the nursery, the baby girls, 100% of their communication is verbal. You might not understand it all, but it's all. Oh, uh -huh. And if another baby cries, the little girls go, who is that? Oh, baby's crying. Boys are 40% verbal. There's a little bit of verbal in there. The other 60%? Noise. Beep, beep, crash. Right? You can hear it. And they could, most of the time, they could care less if another baby's crying. It doesn't even phase them. They're totally good. It stays with you as you grow up. We as women, where you can tell by, women can tell by looking at someone's face if they're having a good day. We can read faces. We can read emotions exuding. Have you ever had an emotional day and your husband comes home and he still has no clue? You're waiting for him to notice because you want him to ask you, what's wrong? Because then you want to unleash, but you're waiting for it. And you're given all these nonverbal, you know, hmm, hmm. And then finally, like at one point, you slam it and he's like, what's wrong? You're like, what's wrong is you didn't notice for two hours that I've been trying to tell you something, right? They're different. Now, detail-oriented, bottom-line oriented, I can hear my husband right now saying, Andrea, land the plane. They get the differences, move on. Okay, gender confusion is a real issue. It's just a real issue, and I think that's why this study on women is going to benefit us, because we're going to see who women were created to be by God, what our true roles should look like on the spectrum, right? We're going to get a real sense of peace because we're going to find satisfaction and fulfillment in who God tells us to be. And who God has chosen us to be is women. Like it or not, every single one of you in here, I'm pretty sure, unless we need to have a conversation, right? And I don't know you as well as I think I do. You have those right female chromosomes. God gave you a, a female gender, and that's who he wants you to be. Again, you don't have to be the girly girl. You don't have to be the fish gutter. I don't remember what I call the other side, right? The, the, just the strong woman, right? What's the name of the 1920s R Rosie Riveter? Isn't that it? With on the old thing with the, you know, she's got the muscles and the tat and, you know, I don't know. Rosie Riveter and girly girl, just be on the spectrum. God doesn't make mistakes. He made you a woman. He made you a girl. We're also going to see the other pressures that are on us as females. Maybe we accept that we're a female, okay? We, we, we've got past that hurdle. I'm a girl, okay, I got that. But then there's other pressures about how you look, about how you think, about how you 
prioritize your day, about what, how you find truth, about uh, those kinds of things. Let's see what God's answer is to those things. That's the goal of this study, is I want to, I want the Lord to open his word to us and erase all those other voices that are pressuring us on the outside and just hear clearly from him what he wants of us. As a mom, as a wife, as a student, as a, as a teenager, as a wherever you find yourself in life in this season, Lord, what do you have for me as a woman here so that I can best glorify you and serve your kingdom? I love that about him because he's going to give it. And we're going to find it in the word, which is why we're calling the study Women in the Word. Now today, I know this is kind of a prop. I don't have a lot of verses to go through today because it's intro week. But trust me, every week we're going to crack this open and we're going to read from here. So you know, my main source of material studying is this. We don't study other books in our women's study. We go through the word because it's the only thing that matters. Now, I do use other commentaries and I do use other, you know, influences as I'm studying someone to see what someone else thought or whatever, but this is the primary source. This is where we're going to get our information from. God made women. He designed us to be different and to be special. And because he designed us, he knows us inside and out. Our qualities that make us female are qualities from him. They're part of his qualities. It's interesting when you get into the Hebrew, um, there are names for God in the Bible that are effeminate. And you think, whoa, are you saying God's a woman? No, I'm not. God always identifies himself as a male. But there are certain titles like um, uh, when he calls himself El Shaddai that combine both the male, which is El, the strong name, the God warrior, the man, and Shaddai. Uh, in Hebrew, it, it references maternal instincts, breastfeeding, like that, that motherly quality. We think sometimes we're nurturers. Well, we get that nurturing from the Lord. We're contributors. We get that quality from the Lord. We get our ability to multitask and our, our emotional side. We get it from him. So he's going to tell us how to use it, how to control it, how best to use it to, to be an example of him. God uses women. Now, I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean it in a good way. In the Bible, we see so many examples of women who were used by God to do great and awesome things, good and bad. We also see some bad ones. We're going to study those ones too, right? It's good to do the good and the bad and get a good balance. Sometimes you have somebody who's both. They have great examples in their life, but they're also not a super good example overall. We'll get there. God loves women. We are so precious to him, like daughters, precious daughters. Um... He desires a closeness with us that's incomparable to anything else we'll experience here on earth. Our husbands are supposed to be pretty close. Our mothers are really close for most of us, um, if you had a good one. Uh, if you didn't, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you didn't get to experience that, but you can with our Father, with our Heavenly Father. He can be that close relationship that we've been craving all our lives. Our security, the God who loves us no matter what shape we're in, no matter how bad our breath smells in the morning, no matter how many, you know, fails we had that week, he's the one who never stops loving us, ever, 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 ever. Being a woman of the word as we study the women of the word. Um, each week we're going to, like I said, crack open our Bibles and discover accounts of women who have gone on before us in God's great history. In this way, hopefully, our view on life our, our actions, the way we react to pressures on the world, it will change and come more in line with what God wants for us. That's the goal. That's our wow study for the year. So next week, uh, we will meet, and our first, can you give me a guess who you think our first woman's going to be? Eve. Of course. Of course it's going to be Eve. Why? Because she was the first one. She's our first example. She's kind of one of those that gives us really good things really not good things, right? And we can blame a whole lot of our troubles on her, but not really because we would have done the same thing. I know you're like, no, I wouldn't have. Yeah, you would have. We'll talk about that next week. So next week, Eve, we're going to move on. If there is a particular woman in the Bible that you are just fascinated with, that you're like, Andrea, please don't miss this person, let me know. I'll throw them in the list. I've got kind of a list already of some of the women I want to go through, but I've got some open-ended things. So if there's someone in there that you're like, man, Andrea, I just really want to know more about Jezebel. Okay.
okay, I won't judge. We'll study, and I'll name you. This is who Robin wanted to know about. No, just kidding, Robin. But so that's the plan. We'll get together. We'll study. We'll crack open the word. We'll find fellowship. You know, in finding fellowship, I encourage you, don't just necessarily end study and run out the door. I get it if you have to be at work early in the morning or you like, okay, I need to check out. But maybe some nights, you know, linger a little bit. Get to know someone's name. You know, that's, this is what it's about. It's about connection. So 715, we did good. Let's pray. We got decaf coffee and pumpkin cookies and other snacks so we can go out there and try, okay? Lord Jesus, oh man, I'm so excited for study. I feel like you wet our whistles tonight, Lord. Father, I'm so grateful for you. I'm so grateful for how you made us. I'm thankful, Lord, that in this confusing world, you've given us an anchor. You've given us somewhere to go where we can learn to be who you want us to be, Lord. We can wipe away the influence of the world and just go back to the roots. Because, Lord, at your roots is where we're going to find happiness and fulfillment. Father, teach us. Even as moms, Lord, if there's any women in here who have girls, Lord, impact us on how we can teach our girls to be girls and women. Um, and let our men be men, if I could say that. Ooh, ouch. I don't know. Lord, that's up to you. Father, thank you for study. Thank you for these women who have given up their time on Monday nights to come. Thank you for even our streaming sisters, Lord, at home uh, and the technology we could do that. Bless our night together, Lord. Bless our fellowship. And please, please bless the study this year with just more of you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.